Good morning to you. I love the worship. Didn't you like that? It's good to be together. If I've not met you, I'm Glenn Schaefer. My wife and I have the privilege of working with a great team of pastors. And John and Steph, who are normally here, are probably wrapping up, if they haven't already, the last session of our encounter retreat. We have 85 participants this weekend down at our encounter retreat in Tulakogi. And we were down there until late last night, and they're having a powerful time. And they had their last session, as some of you know, on the Holy Spirit. Uh, while they're there, we have Jeff Lene in Coastal Chapel in Florida doing a weekend marriage retreat and ministering this morning. So Jerry Vaughn is in Chile. I just like it that we're just all over, don't you? And uh, we got back the Coleman's and us with Kendrick from Real Life. Pastor just got back from Haiti, had a powerful time training pastors there. And some of you know, we not too long ago, we're in just a couple of weeks ago in Pakistan. And the ministry there is very fruitful. And so I want to thank you for being a church with a heart for other places around the world. And Chris is nodding his head because there's opening doors into prisons. I understand it's opening up for the ladies as well coming soon. And i just glad we got people involved in doing the work of the ministry. Somebody say, amen, amen. amen. My, me- my message today is on the theme here of our September, Your New Life, taken out of Ephesians chapter 4 on the sacredness of labor, the purpose of work. I want to talk to you about God's design and work. It's going to be a very practical message today, and I believe it will help us and strengthen us in that because we know our call is to follow Jesus, right? That's what everybody is called. And so the Bible has much to say about work. And most people in America see Christianity about going to church, and we've changed that and say we're the church that goes, right? We don't go to church. We are the church that gathers, and so I want, it's a different mindset, and it changes your whole way that you see you are the church, not this building. When you see this building as the church, you see a separation in your life from sacred and secular, and so you think during the week is secular, and on Sunday is sacred. I think that's a terrible way to view life because all things are sacred in the kingdom of God. Going to get amen. So in that area, you spend about 25 to 30% of your life at work. That's a big portion. And if we don't see the kingdom involved in that, then what do we have? For many Christians in America, they would only see they're going to a building which is not the church, they are the church, but they would see going to the building for an hour and a half a week, which would represent, what, 1% or 2% of their time as being what they do as Christians. And that's got to change. That's got to be altered in us. And part of that is to see how Paul addresses our life living as we should in Ephesians chapter 4. Because as we've stated in the book of Ephesians, which we're preaching through 2019, the first three chapters, which is the first half, was written about what God has done for us. The last half is what we do for God. The first half is the why, meaning this is what Christ did. The Father chose you. The Son redeemed you. The Holy Spirit sealed you. You were made in covenant with God. Everything in chapters 1, 2, and 3 emphasize totally what God did for you. And then in chapter 4, what does he start off with? Therefore, tying it all together, therefore, he said, he urges us to live a life that's fitting or worthy of the calling. That means the calling as a Christian. So there are ought tos, this is in chapters 4, 5, and 6. So today I want to address your Christian life and work, the sacredness of work. And so go with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and just one verse, 28. 
Now, he inserts this right in the middle of telling how we're supposed to think and how we're supposed to talk. And you think he just almost made a mistake inserting this verse. But what does he say in verse 28? Let the thief no longer steal. Now, why would he have to say that? Because this is the gospel invading a Christless culture. You have people coming into the kingdom of God, and they made living dishonestly. They could take unbalanced scales. They could cheat whatever they wanted to do to be able to make a living, and it was acceptable practice among the heathen. Now they come into the kingdom of God, into the body of Christ, the church, and Paul has to write to them. Same way he has to write, husbands, you have your own wife. Why? Because in that culture, they would have other men's wives. And so he would, you mean you have to instruct men just to have their own wife? When you're dealing with a Christless culture, the gospel speaks to that clearly. And so the same way Paul is saying, the thief, tell the one who stole to do what? Steal no longer, but rather let him labor. Everybody say work. Now notice how this is an antidote to a problem with character. Because theft is an issue of the heart, isn't it? So he said, let him who steals, steal no longer, but the antidote. Isn't it interesting that God uses the word work or labor as an antidote to a bad character? Some of you would never remember Jamie Buckingham, but Jamie Buckingham probably was an instigator of, of some of the early charismatic days and even the Charisma magazine. And he was a very influential pastor in America who fell uh, being unfaithful sexually. And as he walked through his restoration, he saw a heart for pastors to help them. And so he started like a ranch or a farm. And one of the things he would do, they would come and live there, and he would have them work with their hands. Why? Because Paul is using the same concept. There's something of character building when you work with your hands. Now, all work is of your hands. Even though you may be working by your mind, you, the hands mean you take possession of it. Okay? So all work fits into that category, whether you're a computer programmer or whatever, you're having to use your whole faculties. So it fits in that same thing. But the idea is that work, responsibilities, is a kingdom concept. Now, I hope you walk out here today saying, thank God for Monday, not just Friday. Amen. I preached a series a few years ago, thank God for Mondays. Because it's easy for us to go out and say, oh, thank God for Friday. And I get it. We all need time off. And I'll talk about that too. But I don't want you to get the wrong concept of work. Because work is very key. So he said, let the thief steal no longer. But rather, let him work, let him labor doing honest work. So that tells us there's two different kinds of work, right? You can have dishonest work, but you don't have to be dishonest if you trust the Lord because he will take care of you. You don't have to worry or cheat and do honest work with his own hands. There's something about owning your labor. I want to talk about that this morning. So that he may have. Everybody say have. The purpose of work is that you may have. There's nothing wrong with having. Now, it's not just about you because he says, so he can share with anyone in need. Now, this is God at work called the invisible hand of Adam Smith's economics that leaves God as sovereign and not the state. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy or at least upheaval in our present culture concerning socialism and capitalism. And the charge often against the capitalist is because he's prideful, greedy, and that's not because of capitalism, that's because of depravity. You can be a capitalist and not sin. But you can't be a socialist and not sin. I'm on pause here a little bit. 
You can't be a socialist except you break three of God's Ten Commandments. That's why it doesn't work. Now, you can find greedy, prideful men and women who are capitalists, but that's not because of capitalism. It's because of depravity of sin. Pride is not just proud that you have more than what someone else has. C.S. Lewis says pride is that you have what they have. He uses the example of, he uses the word chap, that's that English. He says a chap may not be proud, proud just because he has a woman he thinks prettier than anyone else. He wants to have the woman that you want. So there's some real evil in pride, isn't it? It's a deadly sin. So it's slothfulness. We'll get to that. But the reason socialism breaks three of God's commandments is because it's based on covetousness. You can't have socialism without covetousness, meaning one person has something that you don't have. If you want to know why socialism pits people against classes, is because you can't have socialism and communism without a disruption of envy against another. Covetousness and socialism goes together. You can't have socialism without covetousness. Because the premise is what one person has must be distributed to another. Stay with me. That is a Ten Commandment that's broken. You cannot believe in covet cannot believe in socialism without covetousness. Number two, it breaks the Ten Commandments of theft. Theft by vote is still theft. Now there is a place for taxes. Jesus emphasized that. And the order of government is to protect its citizens from within and without. That's the order of God's given dimension for government. It's very limited biblically. And so when there's a covetousness and a demand, here's the third law that it breaks, is it makes the state sovereign instead of God. Socialists usually use Acts chapter 2, around verse 40 on there, where it says they had all things in common, and they saw what they had, and they gave to those who were in need, and everybody had all things in common. And they'll use that as socialism. But notice very clear, clearly that that was God's invisible hand. As Adam Smith declared it in his book of economics, it was an invisible hand that God moved up on people, and he remained the sovereign one of charity. And the reason I know that, because in chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira tried to lie and appear that they sold their land, which they did, and act like they gave the whole amount, it wasn't that just because they didn't give the whole amount that they died, it's because they lied about it. But notice what Peter said. Peter said, why did you do that? Because while that was in your hand, you were free to do with it as you wanted to. Did you hear what I just said? Private ownership is a biblical concept. Compassion and redistribution is from the hand of God. You have candidates promising $1,000 a month to all the people in America. And I don't mean to be derogatory, but the ignorant embrace that because they're not trained biblically, and Christians embrace that because they're not trained biblically. Because ultimately, the bottom of their heart, their covetousness, could I get what somebody else has done without earning it? I remember when Al Gore charged Cheney as being this arrogant, rich capitalist. I don't know if Cheney is arrogant and rich. I guess he's rich, but I don't know if he's arrogant and he definitely was a capitalist, but that year, Al Gore gave $350 to charity. And Cheney gave $7.8 million. 
So you tell me who is charitable. It's not charitable to give somebody else's stuff. I mean, I'm just talking straight. This is going to be the most practical message you've heard in a while. I wish you'd get back to chapters 1, 2, and 3 about who we are in Christ. <laughs> I am talking about who we are in Christ. There has to come a day when people in the world say, I want Christians to work for me. Because they honor, they're honest, they're faithful, they support authority. Come on. And they're Daniels and Josephs. That wherever they go, God blesses them. And people call us and say, do you have anybody in destiny life that needs a job? Wouldn't that be great? Or the body of Christ, because they see you living according a life that is equal to the calling for which you've been called to. Christianity has to get real, doesn't it? There's four ways to gain wealth, biblically. Two of them you have influence on, and two of them you don't. And one of them is the primary way, that when the Bible says, God says in Deuteronomy, I give you the power or the ability to do what? To gain wealth. Now, I want to change the definition of the word wealth to the biblical concept of increase. Because when you think wealth, wealth you're thinking a million dollars in a Rolls Royce. Right? And, and God's not promised you that. Increase is wealth even if it's a dime. I want you to start seeing your increase as wealth. I want you to see when you receive pay. When your boss pays you, he's not doing you a favor. It's a mutual exchange. Are you with me? You have given your life for 40, 50 hours that week, and when they pay you, you're not, in some sense, of being done a favor. It is a valuable exchange. That's why we need to respect the employees, and the employees respect, but it's an honor. Price controls cause scarcity. Let me explain. You said we ought to have milk for $2 a gallon. So let's freeze the price of milk at $2 a gallon. Well, for the first few weeks, that's great. Everybody's got all the milk they want at $2 a gallon. But if you're producing milk, what's going to happen? You're going to look and you say, well, I don't really can't add any employees because at $2 a gallon, it's not working, so I'm going to have to lay off some. And when they lay off some, the cost of production continues to go up. So you say, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to cut back. And the guy who's raising the cow says, I'm not able to sell my milk is for the price that it's costing, so I need to sell some of my cows and get rid of some of those areas. And so after a while, there's a scarcity. Not at first, but after a period of time. That's why the grocery shelves of socialist nations are empty. It's basic economics. Come on. It's biblical too, by the way, to understand these things. So what does minimum wage do? Minimum wage laws cause scarcity of jobs. They're experiencing that in California. You say, well, minimum wage needs to be put at 15. Why not $75? If it's arbitrary, why not $75? You can't live on 15. Right? So why not $75? Are you with me? So what would happen if you make it at a certain price? Because what then they're finding in California right now, okay, $15 an hour, we can't hire as many as we used to hire. It's simple economics. Because it's private ownership. And with private ownership, you have the right to do with your money what you want to do, and the persons have to have a mutual exchange with it. That's why when Jesus told the story about the man who went out and hired someone in the morning and said, you work all day long for a denarii, right? Found him at 9 o'clock, he agreed for a denarii. 12 o'clock, found a denarii. And finally, at 5 o'clock, he found people standing around, and he hired them for a full day's wage for one hour. And when they lined up to get paid, 
The people who had worked all day got angry because they had worked all day and the people who worked an hour got the same pay. They thought they had the right to determine once they had agreed to it. And Jesus said, the owner said, you agreed, what have I done to you? Why are you covetous about what I do with my money? We both agreed. Come on. You go on the market. Your labor is the second most sacred possession you have. Your conscience is your first highest sacred possession. Nobody should rule your conscience but God. Only the word of God. Even in this house, elders do not have authority over your conscience. Only the word of God. If you're transgressing according to the word of God, we can speak to it. But we have no authority over your conscience. Your conscience belongs to the Lord. You're responsible for him. You cannot give your conscience to anybody else. You should not give your conscience to somebody else, but people do. Your conscience is before the Lord, before the Holy Spirit. And the word of God is the authority. So we can confront when people transgress against the word of God. But just preferences and ideas and thoughts, we think you, ought, you shouldn't be doing this. If it's not in the word of God, you can't speak to it. Same way about the idea of Work, work is a high sacred possession. You have the right to go on the market and exchange it for whatever you can. If you want to be, here's what happened. You get paid for solving problems. So I have grass that need to be mowed. That's a problem. You have a lawnmower, so I hire you to solve my problem. You get paid every day for solving problems. Here's what God, God said. He puts man in the garden to tend it, to solve problems. Work is solving problems. Now, if I have my computer that needs to be repaired, there's more people with a lawnmower than there are that know how to fix computers. So guess what? I have to pay more to solve that problem. Sometimes people get upset with management because they say, well, they're getting paid this and I'm only getting paid this. It's because the problem you're solving is not as big a problem they have. Now, I know there's inequities and all that kind of thing, but let's just talk biblical. Solve bigger problems, learn better skills, learn how to increase the value of your labor and go on the market and negotiate. You have the right to negotiate your pay. Because they're not doing you any favor to pay you. You're doing equally, both people pay. And you can even cooperately, like unions, join together. The problem with unions is where they uh, coerce or intimidate if you don't go along with it. There's nothing wrong with taking your labor and joining with a team of you, and you're going to make a negotiation because you have the right of your own labor. Say, my labor belongs to me. So I'm a steward of it before the Lord, isn't it? So if you want to increase your income, then you have a right to increase your ability to earn through education, through skills, through whatever it may be. Investment, these are the only two things you can control, and investments. Let me talk to you about investments. There's no one in this room my age that wish they had not invested more. Come on. I heard some amens. I guess that means they're my age. Now, let me, here's, here's, we did the same thing that everybody does. That $5 won't make a difference. Can I talk to you for just a minute about what we've learned? It's the principle of God increase, not the amount. If you just put a dime aside, at least you're doing it. You're never too poor to invest. And let me tell you, I have been poor. You know what poor is? Biblically poor, poor is if you didn't work next week, you probably wouldn't eat. That's most of us. A biblical rich person is someone who has enough that they don't have to work to earn a living. They can live off of that. That would be considered a biblically rich person. Are you with me? I know you're thinking. So investment could be just a little bit, but get in the principle of it. And while I'm on this, you'd think I get paid by YNAB. You'd think Jonathan gets paid by YNAB. You'd think John gets paid by YNAB. We found, discovered this little app called YNAB. And it has been the best blessing. 
It's called youneedabudget.com. That's pretty good. I want to encourage everybody to get youneedabudget.com. It's a simple means on your phone, on your app, on your computer. You just download your present bank account and put every dollar to work. It took me about two 20-minute videos to learn how to do it. And then I had to kind of get straight, but just it puts every dollar to work. I don't care how stringent it is. I don't know how hard it is for you, but this is Amy and I's in the last year. We've been on in a year. We'd come out of surgery, and this was credit card charges that we were trying to pay off out of four, three or four surgeries that she was involved in. And so we got those paid off. Then here's what happened without, in fact, less income this year. Because when you put a dollar to work, you have to decide are we going to buy those pansies? We went to buy pansies this week, and we were buying a bunch of pansies. Now, if y'all don't know what a pansy is, that's a flower, by the way. <laughs> so we had to decide, I got to move it out of household, out of furnishings, out of this, over to the yard, because I create my own little categories. You know, I love it. I'm telling you, if you didn't do anything but pay your tithe and do this next year, you'd love me so much. So that's just... A side benefit. Go back to the other thing. Would you? It'll help you. Yeah, you can take that one off. What that up thing was, by the way, was our bank account because we did not make any more money, but we began to justify or put it where we wanted to go. I hope I inspire somebody to do it. Work, investments, gifts, and inheritance you can't control, can you? Now, here's the thing about gifts. There have been times if people didn't give us anything, we wouldn't have anything to eat. There's been times if people didn't buy us furniture, we'd have no furniture. There's been times, so I appreciate gifts, and they're from God, but you can't count on them. And the moment you count on them, you will look to people as your source rather than God. And you'll say things to people to manipulate them, to give to you, and tell them if they really love God, they'd be giving to you. That's manipulation. Right? Inheritance. Some may get an inheritance. I hope you treat that as sacred. I, I see this bumper sticker, we're spending our kids' inheritance. I just want to go rip that off the back of the car. I know it's funny, but it's not biblical. The righteous leaves inheritance to their children's children. I don't care what it is. If you get an inheritance, consider it as sacred and use it as investment to build for your children's children. If you need to use a little bit of it, maybe consider it, but don't spend it. Why? Because that's your parents' life. See, God's people used to understand this and they had generational increase. And we've bought into so much of independence of ourselves. we think about today and not about tomorrow. Because we don't think about generations. Now, here's the deal about work. Work is God's idea, isn't it? It was before the fall. Here's what the scripture says. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. This was before the fall. He was responsible to work the garden. Work is sacred. It's God's idea. The fall just gave him sweat on his face, made it harder. That's why Chris wears a headband, because sweat starts on the face, the brow. Have you ever noticed that? Sweat starts on your face. Why? Because of the fall. And he said, you will do this until dust you return. Now, I'm not against retirement if you see it as accumulation so that you are provided for to live without work, but don't look at retirement as the way you can't wait until you're retired. It's a wrong thought that never was in the heart of believers until that came about in our nation a number of years ago. There are people, once they lose their place and they don't know their value, why? Because work has special meaning. That's why I believe that even men who go without work, listen, and women that that are looking for employment or young people looking for employment, they said, I can't find a job. Here's what they mean. I can't find what I want paid 
They're not paying me enough. I'm going to give that job up to another. Here's my principle. Work with what you got and be looking for another one. Because just going to work will do you well. Does that make sense? You don't have to settle, but at least don't fall into the trap of not seeing it as sacred. Why? Because the fall intensified the work, but the fall was not a part of the work. And since the beginning, work has been a part of God's plan for humanity. He created it, and that means you can view work as sacred even if you, even if you don't like your job. Never say, take this job and... You may not like your job, but see your work as what? Sacred. Given by God. Even in retirement, you're responsible for keeping the garden, managing life, increasing for legacy. You never quit. You should not ever quit working. When people quit working, they might as well die, right? You say, well, that's because they're older, Glenn. But no, I've seen people lose their place. Now, it doesn't mean that you have the ability and the energy to do what you used to do. Just shift. Just shift. I mean, when you're 85, you can't do what you did when you were 55. I get that. But just shift your heart. Look at your managing. You're responsible. It may be managing what you have and your family and pouring yourself into others and in the kingdom of God. You, you could be such a wealth of resource. Why? Because you are keeping what is sacred. Work is sacred, therefore commanded. Idleness is a sin, therefore condemned. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, here's what it says. Paul says, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. Man, that's mean. I listened to it. He said, keep away from any brothers walking in idleness. Walking in idleness is a lifestyle. It's not somebody's taking a day off. <laughs> Day off comes later. That's part of what God wants for us. Walking idleness is a lifestyle. So he goes, says, and not in accord with the tradition that you've received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. Paul's talking about himself. Because we were not idle, meaning we did not not labor when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without buying it. Now he goes on to say, I have a right to receive offerings from you because he taught He's not contradicting himself. He taught those who labor by the gospel deserve the gospel. Those who labor in the field deserve that. But he's saying as an apostle, I didn't want you to look at me and say, that's not how a Christian is supposed to live. He was so concerned about them looking at him and saying, okay, Paul's not working. And so he was in a tent business. And he said, I work night and day to be an example to you so Christians will know how to live. Everybody say work. See, it's sacred. And he, and he goes on to say here, we didn't eat anybody's bread without paying for it. He paid for everything. But with late toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might, be able, might not be a burden to any of you. And it was not because we did not have the right, but to give you ourselves as an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. That's why I said it's a command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. You know what's interesting? The compassion of God is discriminate. Proverbs says the compassion of the wicked is cruel. There's a lot of things in this world that we call compassion. It's not compassionate. You'd think that's not compassion, wouldn't you? If he's done work, you don't eat. You would get screamed at in our present culture. But Proverbs would say, here's what you do with someone who won't work. You warn him. You're not being compassionate to him if you give to him. Now, that means giving is discriminate. So I didn't come for to church for all this. <laughs> Paul says, earn your own living. There's something about earning your own living. Now, we know God is our source, Right? But he's making a point here. There's something of sacred of work of the value. Idleness opposes God's nature and his purpose for us. 
How do I know that? Listen to Proverbs. I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. <laughs> Thorns had come up everywhere, and the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins, and I applied my heart to what I observed, and here's what I learned. Here's the lessons I learned. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and poverty will overtake you. The Bible tells us how increase or wealth comes. It also tells us how poverty comes. Poverty is a state of being. It's not being broke. Poverty is a spiritual state. It's not being without. I grew up poor. I know what one house is with four rooms and a path. Some of you thought I said bath, but I said path. I know what it's like to go without. I know as a couple, all of us start off having nothing, but we were never in poverty. Because poverty is different than not having something. Poverty is a spiritual state. And he says, poverty overtakes those who are slothful. And in, in Proverbs 26, it says, they say there's a lion in the street and I can't go out. There's always an excuse to the sluggard. He's like a door who turns on its hinges. He turns on his bed, meaning you can't get him away from, he's connected to the bed. Not literally. The bed is laziness is what this, it's his term. It's not that he's laying down all the time. And then it says he's wiser than seven men. So you, he's already made his mind up. You can't convince him. That's why he has to be left alone. Yet Proverbs 28 says, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. Everybody say plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. You know what following worthless pursuits is? Waiting on publishing clearinghouse. Hey, I've done that. Come on. Maybe not publishing clearinghouse, but that every major loss we had was going to wait till the what? Ship comes in, right? And Proverbs says that's foolish. You know, there are people who quit working because they think they're going to the casino to make money or they're going to get their publishing clearinghouse. And when that comes through, man, I am going to buy everything and for everybody. Proverbs says foolish. You want to increase little by little work and investment so that most people make most of their income of their life from 45 to 65. It's not too late to start wherever you are. It's interesting, isn't it? The hand of the diligent will rule, but the slothful will be under a tyrant. Did you know our government was only made for us to live under self-government? Our constitution is not designed for people who are not willing to be under self-rule themselves. It's not designed for that. And every nation on the face of the earth who will not teach its people to be self-governed under God will find themselves under tyrants. And America could very well face that. If that happens, the church will have to stand out. The church will have to be the example. He'll be like Paul writing, saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be an example in your work and labor and wear the cloak, the gospel like a cloak because we live in a culture with dictators and, and terrorists. When I first started going to Haiti, I see Luna back there in the back uh, and was on the worship team. When we first started going to Haiti in 1984, Papa Doc was the dictator king of Haiti. Things ran pretty well, and any woman could walk down any street in Haiti and never get raped. Couldn't do that today. But at the same time, if you committed a crime, there was no trial. You just disappeared. Because that's what tyrants do. And people who are not under self-government want that. They would rather give up their own responsibility and be under a tyrant and under a king rather than be self-governed under God by the Scripture. Why? Because we get slothful and lazy rather than being responsible. As Paul said, earn your own living and be responsible yourself. 
That's all right. I'll play this back and amen myself. <laughs> Thank God for internet. I want to talk to you about work as God is your boss real quickly. Here's what the scripture says. Work hardly as for the Lord. Whatever you do, work hardly as for the Lord and not for men. If you're one of those that says, man, we had fun today, the boss was gone. Shame on you. (laughs) Isn't it interesting how we get into that mindset, isn't it? Because we're under authority of God. We're under, and, and Paul says you don't work that way. If you will go to work like you work for the Lord and not for men, it changes everything. Knowing that from the Lord, watch this, knowing from the Lord you will receive an inheritance. There's probably very few people in this room that know that they're going to receive an inheritance from the Lord for going to work. Is that what it says? Yes, it says that. You think, yeah, for winning souls. No, 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 no. He's talking about whatever you do. Everybody say whatever. Whatever you do, work hardly as unto the Lord. He honors your heart unto him as you work. That's why I said, let this house be full of Joseph's and Daniel's where everybody wants to hire us. They could be gone and the factory and the plant and the office, everything would run as if they were there. That's what they did with Joseph. Joseph. That's why they put him in charge. For the Lord was with him. If you want to improve, focus on that. Work is working unto the Lord. Don't get upset about you have to go to work. Say, God, thank you that work is sacred. So I don't like my job. Well, keep working the one you have until you get a better one because you can negotiate that. But don't get angry at work. Why? Because the Lord is your boss. Lastly, work requires a Sabbath. Work requires rest. If you are working, you will want to honor the Sabbath. Now, I'm not talking about Saturday and Sunday because every day belongs to the Lord. Just find one that works for you. I don't care if it's Thursday. Are you with me? Because Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, it's good for you. It also honors God. If you, in your mind, think I can't take a day off because I don't think I will make the money I'm supposed to make, you're driven not by faith in God, but by your own self. You have to trust God to have a Sabbath, don't you? So what's a Sabbath? A Sabbath is a day you don't work to make an income. So you say, well, on my day off, I go start a second business. You need a Sabbath. Not for your sake only, even though it is for you, but it honors God with your work and your labor. Come on, our whole life belongs to God. And so what happens when I understand that I'm honoring him because it is a place of work. Here's what I want you to know. Life, here's why work is so important. Life without work, listen, is meaningless. But work must never become the meaning of your life. Did you get that? Is that on the board? Life without work is meaningless. But you must never be... But work must never become the meaning of life because that's the workaholic, isn't it? Work gives life meaning, but it can't be your meaning for life. Here's another way of saying it. Work is not your life's purpose, but work has purpose in your life. What is purpose? It's Christ in you. It's being the believer in all areas of life. So I have a challenge for us today. I have three questions I want to ask you. This is a real practical message, and I want you to walk away with a couple thoughts in mind. I want you to weigh, 
Lord, how have I seen my work? How have I viewed work? I want you to see it as sacred, given to God, and that you begin to work in that way. Here's the three questions I want to ask. In fact, would you mind standing, and I want to challenge you on these questions right before the Lord as you stand there. Here's what I want you to take home. If my work is God-given, how should I present myself at work? Now, this is not only for employees, this is also for owners. Because owners represent Christ's authority as a believer. As Amy and I are a couple, we're not just a couple. Uh, God's character is not just manifested in the male. God's character is not manifested just in the female. The Bible says male and female, he created them in his image. And men alone cannot express the full character and image of God. Women alone cannot express the full character and image of God. And anything that pits one against the other is anti-God. I don't care if you even use scriptures to pit one against one another. And in our culture, when you see Women hating men and men hating women, it is anti-God, isn't it? Because why? It is the very image of God. That's why in your marriage, if your wife is not seen as an equal with you and worthy of their impression and expression and their opinion, you're not seeing their value as God's character. Now, here's how I say it. Amy and I, and your husband and wives are equal in every area but one. And it has to do with responsibility. Because Adam was created first, God put the responsibility on him even in the fall. It's not in Eve we all die. It's in what? In Adam we all die. And yet Eve sinned first. Because Adam was there watching, and Adam had responsibility. And there's been times as a husband, I didn't want that responsibility. Especially when we get in a tiff, and I know it's my responsibility to repent first. <laughs> Doesn't she ever have to first? I'm serious. I mean, I actually got into that a few months ago because she really did a wrong, which she hardly ever does, but she really did wrong, and I was going to determine that she came to me first. I have not had the chance to experience that. Come on, you guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? And then I heard my own preaching. God used my own preaching against me. But isn't that true about all leaders? You know, as a pastor, if there's a conflict, wouldn't you expect me, if I'm the leader, to come to you? If I go, well, bless them, man. They, They need to come to me. You'd go, man, he's an immature leader. Bosses are the same way. You have responsibility to reflect Christ, don't you? And hear from the employees. One of the reasons employees protest is because they're not being listened to. To engage. Why? Because they share in a value. I'm just talking about, what about your work? If you're an employer or if you're an employee, if my work is God-given, how should I present myself at work? I want you to walk out of here hearing a message today that changes how you go to work in the morning. That you embrace Mondays, that I'm walking into a sacred work. It's not, oh me, but oh, this is right. And I'm going to get a reward if I work according as unto the Lord. The Lord's remembering this, and he will reward you for that. Isn't that powerful? I believe that's why those people prosper. I believe that's why. If increase comes from work, how shall I honor God with my work? That's honoring him with the tithe. When you tithe, you're saying my work belongs to God because this work, I, this week I went and I exchanged my life with my labor. In the exchange, I was given a monetary or whatever increase is because increase is wealth. And I honor him with my tithe. You know what that is? That's big faith because you're honoring him with what he gave you last week before next week is over, and that takes faith to tithe before the next week is over. That's a fun thing to do, to challenge yourself to tithe first. And on your YNAB, 
You can set up your tithe and your giving, your missions, whatever, and your savings, and then all of your bills underneath that. I'm throwing in YNAB again, aren't I? But it'll help you. You know why I'm doing it? Because we're supposed to be stewards. Please hear me. It's so easy to go, oh, yeah, I'm steward. No, 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 no. You say, well, I use mint because it tells me what I spent. I know, but I want you to know where you're going to spend it, not what you spent. Redirecting it. Because what has been my responsibility at work is how I honor God with every area. Lastly, what's been your attitude about work? I want to lead you in a prayer right now. I want the Lord to shift in us any area. If there's anybody in this room that God's talking to you about changing your mind, that really is another word for repentance. If you really see it by truth, you say, God, forgive me for viewing it wrongly. It could be you're holding back blessings and prosperity and increase in your life. The gentleman came up to me at the end of the last sermon. He said, that message was for me. He said, I used to live every day for retirement. And then 2008, I lost all of my retirement. There's nothing wrong with retirement. I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But some people put their hope, like the man who builds the house and says, you know what I'm saying. They put their hope in riches rather than in Christ. And he said, I lost it all. And he said, guess what I did? He said, I went back to work. And today, he said, I'm back around and I can retire because I will have, be able to do so with full provision. But my heart is totally different right now. I want to do stuff for the kingdom of God. It's a different mindset, isn't it? So say this with me. Father, I accept your son Jesus as Lord of my life. I thank you for work. I thank you that you ordained work and it's sacred forgive me for opposing work I see it has meaning but my life is in you Christ and not in what I do but thank you for the opportunity to tend the garden I take my work my income and I honor you with it